May the Lord give you his peace. Today's Franciscan saint of the day is Blessed Filippa Marari, Virgin Second Order. Our reading is taken from the Franciscan Book of Saints by Marion Habig, OFM, published in 1979 by the Franciscan Herald Press. February 16th, Blessed Filippa Marari, Virgin Second Order. Filippa, who belonged to the illustrious family of the Marari, saw the light of day in the castle of her parents near Rieti in Italy, toward the close of the 12th century. At a very early age, she was the favorite of all who knew her, not only because of her natural gifts, but principally because of her steady advancement in perfection. As a young woman, she lived quietly at home, devoted to prayer and the cultivation of her high mental endowments. She took particular pleasure in reading the Holy Scriptures and studying the Latin language, in which she became very proficient. About this time, St. Francis often visited the valley of Rieti, where he established several convents and sometimes called at the home of a devout Mereri. His forceful admonitions, filled with holy simplicity and unction, and his severe life of penance made a deep impression on Philippa. It was not long before she resolved to imitate her Holy Father, for going wealth and consecrating herself entirely to God. She rejected a proposal to marry with the words, quote, I already have a spouse, the noblest and the greatest, our Lord Jesus Christ. Unquote. Neither the remonstrances of her parents nor the ridicule of her brother Thomas had any effect in changing her mind. She cut off her hair, donned a very coarse garment, and with several companions withdrew to a cave in the rocks of a nearby mountain. Her austere life of penance and intimate union with God changed the resentment and mockery of her family into admiration. Thomas visited the mountain recess to ask Philippa's forgiveness and placed at her disposal the Church of St. Peter and an adjacent convent once occupied by the Benedictines, over which he was the patron. Full of joy, the young community took up its abode there, accepting the place as a gift from heaven. They lived according to the rule of St. Clair under the direction of Blessed Roger of Todi, to whom St. Francis had entrusted the care of their souls. The new foundation flourished remarkably, and many of the noblest women joined their ranks. Philippa's excellent example and loving manner were particularly instrumental in bringing about these results. Although she filled the capacity of superior, she was the humblest member of the community. She had no equal in zeal for prayer and mortification. And like St. Francis and Blessed Roger, she held poverty in the highest esteem. She exhorted her sisters to have no care for the morrow. And more than once in times of need, her trust in God was singularly rewarded with miraculous assistance. Philippa had lived and labored and made sacrifices for God for many a year when it was revealed to her that the time of her dissolution was at hand. She was received with a seized with a fatal illness. Gathering her sisters around her deathbed, she bade them farewell and exhorted them to persevere in their efforts towards perfection and to remain united in sisterly love. Having received the last sacraments at the hands of Blessed Roger, she addressed to her sisters the words of the apostles, quote, The peace of God which surpasses all understanding Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus." Unquote. Then she expired quietly on February 16, 1236. Striking miracles occurred on the very day of her burial, and many more had occurred since then during the years. Shortly after her death, Pope Innocent IV approved the veneration paid to her, and Pope Pius VI in 1806 renewed the approbation. To this day, very many people journey to the church in which her body, still incorrupt, reposes. Our meditation is, Godliness is profitable to all things. Consider how the words of the Apostle, Godliness is profitable to all things, were verified in Blessed Philippa. In youth, she pres preserved godliness from the dangers which wealth and social position are so apt to bring in their train. Godliness protected her from an unhappy choice of a state in life. It made her happy in her holy vocation in which even her family considered themselves blessed. 
finally gave her happiness in having so many spiritual daughters gathered about her in the service of the Lord, while it secured her a crown of bliss in eternity, of which the Church herself assures us in her beatification. Hence we see fulfilled in her what the Apostle adds about godliness, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. If godliness and the fear of the Lord were heeded everywhere by youth, if they were the determining factors in choosing a state of life, everyone would be happier in his state, while the members of the family, though they may have opposed it in the beginning, would thank God that the choice turned out as it did. May you never have the opposite experience. Consider that godliness is a useful in secular life, as in the religious state. It takes into consideration, first of all, what is eternal and co is concerned, at all times that the soul suffer no harm. That is really the only thing that deserves consideration. For what does a profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul? What benefit has Debus now of all his wealth? He is suffering the torments of hell. But we may be sure that godliness will avail even in this life to help us receive what we shall eat and drink and wherewith we shall be clothed. For seek first the kingdom of God and his justice and all these things shall be added unto you. Even if godly people ever suffer poverty and want because God sees that 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 is profitable to them, they need not be unhappy on the account, though they should suffer as great want as Lazarus. For they know that the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come that shall be revealed in us. Have you valued godliness according to its true worth? Consider how piety that proves useless or even hurtful to a good Christian life can be that very fact be recognized as false piety. Through it God is not honored, but the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. Praying a great deal, spending a lot of time in church, communicating frequently, going on pilgrimages, and indulging every pious fancy is not necessarily piety. True piety is minded, first of all, to discharge its obligations and attends no services that would interfere with them. For nothing is pleasing to God, says St. Bernard, whereby we will neglect duty. Genuine piety, furthermore, prefers to do the will of another as far as possible rather than its own. It prefers to be governed rather than to govern. It patiently bears with the imperfections of others, and it considers the service it can render the poor and the afflicted as the best service to God. Is this the kind of piety you possess? May it be given us through the intercession of Blessed Philippa to manifest in ourselves to the honor and glory of God the admirable fruits of true godliness. Prayer of the Church O God, let us glorify thy servant Philippa with great merciful merci, miracles. <laughs> Mercifully grant us that we who devoutly implore intercession may be granted the wholesome fruits of her prayer. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hope you enjoyed the background music. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he show his face to have mercy upon you. May he turn his countenance towards you give you his peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pax et bonum.